Good morning, Sycamore. Thank you for gathering with me this morning for our Bible study this uh, on this Sunday morning, especially this morning because it's Father's Day. It's a day to honor our fathers and not only fathers, but men in general. And, uh, you know, I think we need that in our society to remember the importance of men, to remember the importance of fathers. As a father, it's been my greatest privilege in life. Outside of being able to be a child of God and to be able to preach the gospel, my greatest honor in life is to be a father. And I know that many of you feel the exact same way about it with your children and your families. You know, on Father's Day, fathers get all kinds of gifts. It's kind of a neat day because uh, you get all kinds of things, especially when your children are little. There's no telling what you're going to get uh, for Father's Day. And fathers appreciate everything that they get because they come, those gifts come from the ones that they love. And it means so much. But I want to share with you this morning, there's three things that I believe that every father needs to get on Father's Day. Three gifts that every father should get on Father's Day because they remind him of his duty to his family, his responsibility, the responsibility of being a husband and a father. And they also remind his family of what it is that he means to them and that uh, what he should be uh, in their lives also. Those three gifts are a flashlight, a belt, and a toolbox. And for the next few minutes, let me share with you the importance or the, or the symbolism of those particular gifts. First of all, we have a flashlight. Father must be the leader of his home. And the flashlight kind of illustrates to us that where he ought to be in his home. And in that family dynamic, where the father ought to be. You see, in the dark, it's the person with the light that walks out in front. You know, you don't take the light and, 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 and shine it up above everybody or around the side of everybody. The person with the light is in the front because the light needs to be in front of us so that we know where it is that we're going and the steps that we're making. And that's what fathers must do. You know, as leaders, it's a father's duty to be out in front and be visible to those in his own family, those in his charge. He needs to be in front of and visible to. And he needs to take those who are following him in the right direction. And in doing so, he needs to develop and earn their trust. A father needs to always try to do that which is right so that even when he fails, he doesn't lose the trust of his family. You know, fathers aren't superheroes. We, we would love to be, but we're not. And sometimes we fail. But if our family trusts us as a leader, then our failures don't cause a lack of trust. Fathers are like the shepherds of the sheep. Jesus spoke in John chapter 10 about the good shepherd. And how he calls to his sheep and they hear his voice. That's what we need to be as fathers. We need to be in front of our family where they need to trust us so much that when we speak, they follow and they do so out of trust. One of the places that we always go to when we're talking about fathers and, and, and about husbands especially is Ephesians chapter 5. And one of the reasons that we need to be out in front and that, we, that our family needs to trust us, specifically in this case, our wives need to trust us, is because of the role that the wife plays in the home. The role that our wives play in our homes has to be one that is built completely on trust. In Ephesians chapter 5, listen to verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is Savior, he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, 
Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Wives are given a unique role in the home. Now, what I just read to you is not popular in society, but society is not who we're going to answer to and be accountable to. When you enter into marriage, you're entering into God's institution. And in God's institution, there's a head and there is followers. And, but if you notice husbands, if our wives are to be submissive to us and in subjection to us, and we are to be the head over the wife, that's not a position of, of authority. It's not a position of, of superiority. It's a position of responsibility. It's a position that means that you and I need to be leaders and out in front because if our wives are going to submit to us as they are supposed to do, then you and I have to be the leaders that we are supposed to be so that they can trust us enough to do what God has asked them to do. Otherwise, we as husbands are hindering them from obeying God. See, there's not, no godly husband sees his role as superior. He sees his role as a leader being one of honor and one where so much trust has been placed in him and he should be honored by that trust and never, ever break it. Same thing with our children in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. It says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord or the training in the admonition of the Lord. We don't provoke our children to wrath by lording over them and bossing them around and sending them here and sending them there. We lead them. We train them. And in doing so, we develop their trust. And they know that dad's not going to take us in the wrong direction. He only has the best intentions for us. And our children will follow. To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the thought is to be in the front. Training, not teaching. Training, not telling. Training, not sending. Fathers must be leaders. That doesn't mean a dominant force barking orders and instructions to everyone. It means a strong and recognizable voice that's out in front of the family. It means a trusted guide as Christ is the head of the church. That's our model. And that's what we must model ourselves after. The second gift that I believe every father ought to get for Father's Day is a belt. What does a belt do? You ever thought about that? Well, it holds up your pants. Well, that's true. Belt's a pretty versatile thing, though. Do you know what a belt really does? A belt supports and it maintains things the way they ought to be. Think about that. You put on your belt so that it will maintain things where they ought to be. It keeps things in order, if you will. In our homes, regardless of what society thinks, discipline is required in a home that is pleasing to God. And the Father is responsible for that discipline. So that's what the belt symbolizes, is father supporting his family in such a way that he maintains the order of things as they need to be. That's discipline. And before we start talking about discipline, uh, other members of the family, fathers, you have to first discipline yourself. You see, fathers must make sure they have their belt on before they can take it off. When it comes time to discipline your family, you better make sure you don't have to run and get your belt. 
What we're talking about here is self-discipline. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, the apostle Paul said, I discipline myself daily. I bring my body into subjection daily. Why? Lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified, he said. A father who says, do as I say and not as I do, is disqualified from being a parent. We need to show discipline before we demand discipline. And you know, if we'll do that, if more fathers would wear their belt, they'd have to take it off less. If we would show discipline to our children, we would have to administer discipline fewer times to our children. And discipline, when it is to be administered, must be done in love. You see, love is manifested in discipline. If I love my children, I'm going to give them rules to follow. Not so that I can say, look what my kids will do, but so that I can share with my children the importance of responsibility, the importance of duty, and safety. Discipline keeps our children safe. It's like putting a fence around your yard to keep your dog from running in the road. It doesn't keep the dog from running. It keeps them from bitten in the road. It keeps them safe. That's what discipline does. Discipline is protection for us. Proverbs 13, 24, Proverbs 19, and verse 18 teach us that if we love our children, we'll discipline them. He who spares his rod hates his son. Now that's pretty straightforward language. But what it's talking about is if you love your kids, you'll discipline them. If you love your family, you'll give them parameters. If you love your family, you're going to set rules and boundaries for them. Hebrews 12 and verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. See, because love is manifested in discipline. But it's also returned through discipline. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, if you love me, do what I've told you to do. If you love me, don't go outside my rules. You know, we live in a religious world today, so it's not about rules, it's about a relationship with Jesus. Well, the only way you can have a relationship with Jesus is to obey his commands. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, be disciplined. If you love me, accept my discipline. Because you better know it's been given in love. And if you and I as fathers will, will discipline our children in love, they're not going to question us as to our motive. And if they don't question our motive and they trust us, then they're going to be more apt to live in accordance with our discipline. Now saying something that's not going to be very popular amongst our society, and it's this. Husbands, you are also to discipline your wives when necessary. Sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes you have to put your foot down. Sometimes you have to make the decision. Now, in a, in a marriage, husbands and wives, uh, there's give and take and there's relationship that is, is hopefully uh, appears equal anyway. And when there's mutual respect, then you really can't tell who's the head and who's in subjection because they're... The roles are so seamless, but sometimes a husband has to make a decision and sometimes has to say no. A husband has to set certain rules in his family that have to be honored even by the wife. I'm not talking about bossing or lording or, or putting somebody under your thumb or any of that, that, that's, that violates so many other scriptures. But when it comes time to be the head of the house, folks, the husband has to be the head of the house. 
has to make those final decisions. If you're not ready to do that, men, don't become husband. Discipline's not always pleasant at the time. Hebrews 12 and verse 11 uh, says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Fathers need belts to remind them of their role as disciplinarian in the home and to remind the gift giver of the father's role as disciplinarian in the home too. The third gift that I think every father ought to receive for Father's Day is a toolbox. Now this one is not one of those construction toolboxes that you carry when you build your house. This one is one of those that you have within your home to maintain. And inside it has a lot of uh, uh, versatile things that you might need uh, from time to time to do different work. And what this box represents in our lesson today is a father's need to provide. See, as fathers, we're not lords of the manor. As fathers, we're not uh, uh, the boss of the family. As fathers, we are to serve our family. Husbands are to be the head of their families and serve as Christ is the head of the church and serves it. Philippians 2 and verse 7, Jesus came to the earth in the form of a bond servant. In Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. And he's still serving us. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus is making intercession for us even today. He's still serving and providing. Fathers, if you and I are going to be like Christ, we too should be serving and providing for our families. It's a father's job. It's a husband's job to provide for his family. Now we think of that so many times as just bringing home a paycheck, but it goes so much deeper than that. Father... Uh, fatherhood and father's job it goes so much further than that but how do we do our jobs and how do we provide for our families how do we give our families what they need first of all how do we provide physically if you're going to provide physically for your family what must you do and the answer is you go to work in first timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 says if anyone does not provide for his own and especially of those of his own household he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We go to work, don't we? Isn't that why we have jobs? Jobs are, are, are somewhat fulfilling in themselves in that we are, we are uh, accomplishing something with our lives and, and that we are doing something important. But beyond that, jobs are, are for the provision of our families. We provide food and shelter and clothing by going to work. How do we provide spiritually for our family? You know, the answer is the same. If we go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Be diligent uh, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A worker. Spiritually, you and I as fathers are to provide for our families. Spiritually, you and I as husbands are to be the spiritual leaders of our families. We do that by studying God's word and by obeying it and by being out in front of our families in doing so. We need to be the spiritual leader of our homes. Oh, well, my wife takes care of that. Folks, that's not an answer. Our wives have an opportunity and an obligation in their own spiritual lives, in their own spiritual leadership. But you and I as husbands are the spiritual leaders of our home. If we are the head of the home, then we're also the spiritual head of our home. We don't get to pass that off to our, our wives. We don't get to pass that responsibility off. It's our responsibility. 
How do we fulfill the, the responsibilities to provide spiritually? We go to work. We need to be workmen that need not be ashamed standing before God. If you and I will be students of God's word, if you and I will apply God's word to our lives, we'll be able to stand before God one day without shame. And if we can do that, if we can stand before God unashamed, then we can stand before our family unashamed. We must provide for them physically, we must provide for them spiritually, and we must do it all in love. We must love them unconditionally. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 talks about how a husband loves his wife the way Christ loves the church and nourishes and cherishes. That's our motivation to go to work physically and spiritually. We are to provide whatever it is that our families need, we provide. That's what a husband does. That's what a father does. First and foremost, husbands and fathers must be servants because to us, that's what Jesus was. And if he is our example, then we too need to be servants. We're not kings sitting on thrones. We're not, we're not lords telling everybody what to do. We're, we're not supervisors pointing and prodding and pushing. We're servants, servants of God, servants of our own family, trusted advisors, trusted leaders, so that our word means something. With Jesus as our example. Flashlight, because we need to be the leaders in our homes and take our families where they need to go. A belt because we need to be disciplinarians in our homes and set down the rules. And a toolbox because we need to provide for our families. You know, in our society today, fatherhood has become somewhat of a joke. Dads are usually downplayed, not even necessary. And when they are portrayed, they're portrayed as bumbling or stupid. We've taken the role of fatherhood and we've pushed it to the side and we've said, well, fathers need to be there when the children are made, but they don't necessarily need to be around when the children are growing up. That's ridiculous. And look where it's got our children right now. Look where it's got our society right now. Look where we are right now. And why is that? Is it because some party's in charge or another party's in charge? No, it's because fathers aren't in the home doing what they need to be doing. It's time for husbands and fathers to stand up and to be more afraid of facing God one day than they are of facing society. They need to assume the role that God has given them. They need to become the leaders in their own homes, and they need to be what God expects them to be when they take on the role of husband and father. See, our country is weak right now because our families are weak. And our families are weak because our fathers are weak or non-existent. Wives and children, you need to honor and respect the men in your life, especially when they stand up and take the role that God has given them. If you will give him what he needs, the love, the trust, the honor and the respect that he deserves, he will provide you what you need. And that's God's plan. And it doesn't matter what society thinks. It doesn't matter. You may not agree with some of the things that I have told you today in this short lesson, but make sure of this. If you disagree with me because of an opinion I may have given, and that's... That's where we may just simply disagree. But if you disagree with me because of scripture I've given, then you got a problem. Because once God speaks, it doesn't matter what you think or I think or society thinks or the majority thinks or this party thinks or this woman thinks or this man thinks. It doesn't matter. 
Once God says it, that's the way it is. Folks, God created the family, and only God can lead it and fix it. Only God can tell us what he wants in our marriages and in our homes. And if we'll just listen to him, everything changes. Everything changes. Please prayerfully look into these scriptures that we've shared today, into these thoughts that we've shared today. Scripture is very plain on the roles of men and women in the home. Scripture is very plain and very easily understood. It's not our job to change a family. It's our job to be God's family. I appreciate you spending this time with me. And may God bless your efforts in studying his word. Until we meet again, God bless you.